John chapter 11, beginning now at verse one. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother was Lazarus, was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now if you take a look at John chapter 11, verse one, it begins with the words, now a certain man was sick. And you, because many of you have been with us through a lot of these teachings through the Gospel of John, you might already know what to expect. Now a certain man was sick. Now a certain man was blind. Now a certain man was paralyzed. Now a certain this, this, this. You know, all right, somebody's afflicted. Jesus is going to do something. I mean, you kind of know the pattern so far through the Gospels and specifically through the Gospel of John. But now at this point, it's gonna be a little bit of a different thing that happens. And what's gonna unfold for us in John chapter 11, we're gonna take a look at both this week and next Sunday, we're gonna see something that is in some ways the most remarkable miracle that Jesus performed, if you wanna say apart from his own work on the cross and resurrection. The most remarkable work that he ever performed on another person we're gonna see in John chapter 11, the raising of a man named Lazarus. Now, if you notice there, verse one introduces us to the major characters. We have Lazarus, Mary, and her sister Martha. This was a family that Jesus had a close relationship. I find a little bit fascinating that seemingly both Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, all together the same family, all living in the same village of Bethany, which was just a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. Jesus had a friendship with this family. Uh, apparently, when he was in the Jerusalem area, it would be common for him to stay at their house. He had a friendship with this. It seems that none of them were married. We have no mention of uh, a wife for Lazarus or a husband for Mary or Martha, at least at the time of the scripture's writing, they weren't married. So there they were, just a collection of single friends. They're together, close. And we get this news that Lazarus is sick, and so we're expected that Jesus would do something about this. Matter of fact, if you notice it in verse three, it says, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Do you know what's missing from the words of verse three there? Is any kind of request that Jesus would do something about it. Lord, he whom you love is sick, would you please come and heal him? Lord, he whom you love is sick, would you please just do something? Mary and Martha make no direct request of Jesus, and do you know why? There's a sense in which they didn't need to. Listen, they had such a close friendship with Jesus that they understood that merely to make the need known to Jesus was an invitation for him to do something about it. Now I know that God asks us to pray and to ask for specific things. And, and don't be shy about asking God to move and to work in your life. Nevertheless, I think it's an important principle to know that when you just pour out your needs to God, it is an invitation for him to come and to work in the midst of it. So they present the need to Jesus. Now look at verse four and fasten your seatbelts for this. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Friends, when we walk ourselves through verses four, five, and six, we see something remarkable and if I could say it, a little bit scary about how Jesus works. The first thing I want you to notice here is found in verse four where Jesus says, this sickness is not unto death. This sickness is not unto death. Jesus said that. All right, I don't know how exactly how to put this, but Lazarus died, number one. Number two, and I can't get into the complicated chronology of it, you know, how many days traveling, how many days waiting, all of that. Without getting into the complicated chronology of it, let me just say, Lazarus was already dead when Jesus said those words, and Jesus knew it. 
Now, when the messengers left Bethany, by the way, Jesus was a good day's journey away from Bethany in the place called Perea. That's where we leave him at the end of John chapter 10. When the messengers left Bethany, Lazarus was still alive. In the day it took them to travel and to get to Jesus, by all chronological accounts that we can piece it together, Lazarus was already dead and by a supernatural gifting of the Holy Spirit, what some people might call the word of knowledge or something like that, Jesus seemed to know that Lazarus was dead, yet nevertheless, he says right here in verse four, this sickness is not unto death. Now friends, I just wanna point one thing out. You and I would never speak this way. Now we get the idea of Jesus here. This is how you and I might phrase it. We might say it something like this. The sickness is unto death, but God will glorify himself in it. Wouldn't you and I feel comfortable speaking in such a way? Lazarus will die, but don't worry, guys. God will work in and through this, and he'll glorify himself in it. That's how I would feel much more comfortable saying, but listen, I want you to notice something. You and I are so focused on the process that oftentimes we forget that Jesus is much more focused on the end result. That's why Jesus says, okay, yeah, I know Lazarus is gonna die. Matter of fact, I know he's dead right now. But this sickness is not about death. This sickness is about the glory of God. So it doesn't even matter to me that Lazarus is dead right now. That's nothing to me. I know that I will raise him up. I am focused on the end, on the product, on what I'm gonna do. Don't get obsessed with the process. Look at what I am going to do in the product. Jesus can see the end of it all before it even happened. That's the first thing to notice. Second thing to notice, look at verse five. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. John's reminding us, Jesus really loved these guys. He loved them. By the way, it's almost unique in the phrasing of it. John makes a point to mention Lazarus and Mary, and Martha. He wants us to know that not only did Jesus love them, but he loved them individually. He loved them personally. He loved this family. And then the next sentence doesn't really seem to go together, at least not immediately in my mind. Verse six, therefore, he stayed two more days. I love them so much that I will not respond immediately to their need. I love them so much that I'm just gonna stay here where I'm at for two more days, even though I already know that Lazarus is dead, I'm gonna stay here two more days. Friends, this delay was almost certainly mystifying and frustrating to the disciples, and it was agonizing to Mary and Martha. But listen, this is what I want you to know. It's hard for us to grab onto this, isn't it? that love was behind the delay. When I really want, or let me put it another way, not want, when I really believe I need God to move in a certain way, it is very difficult for me to believe that his delay is out of love. I I almost instantly think that his delay is to punish me. You know, I've been a bad boy and therefore God has to spank me around a little bit and so the the, the delay is to punish. In my worst moments, I think that the delay is to kind of torture me a little bit. But friends, I need you to understand this principle. Whenever Jesus delays He delays because of love. It was true in this situation. It's true in our situation. I'm not trying to sugarcoat this. Jesus prolonged the agony of Mary and Martha. If he would have left right away, Lazarus still would have been dead by the time that he got there. But friends, it would have spared Mary and Martha two days of grief-stricken agony, but Jesus said, even though I will allow them to experience two more days of grief-stricken agony, what I do in the big picture is much better than if I would have left immediately. I love them too much to leave right away. 
This is, um, this is hard ground to walk on, isn't it? I'd much rather talk to you about this than live it. But we all have to live it in some time or another, do we not? Do we not have to live it sometime where we just accept what God has done and a delay that we can't see any reason for? Friends, I guarantee you, Mary and Martha could not understand any logical reason why Jesus would delay two days. But yet he had a good and perfect purpose for this deliberate delay, and it was because of love. Now going on to verse 7. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus, after two days, he says to the disciples, okay, guys, we're going back to Judea. Jesus had left the region of Judea for safety, for some breathing room, for some, to, to recharge the batteries, so to speak, before this great battle, before the very end. But now he says, okay, guys, it's time to go back to Judea. And the disciples say, whoa, what are you talking about, Jesus? You are a wanted man in Judea. The religious leaders in Jerusalem have you on the most wanted list. The last time you were there, they were holding rocks and getting ready to stone you. I don't know how you made it out of there alive, but you did. Why would we ever go back there? And Jesus says something fascinating. Look at what he says in verse 9. Are there not 12 hours in the day? In other words, Jesus just disregarded the danger. He knew that he still had work to do, and he was, in a sense, invulnerable until he completed the work that God had for him to do. Friends, God has appointed each to us a time. Now, Jesus knew exactly when his time was. He, he could read, I'll use kind of a silly figure speech if you'll allow it, he could read the expiration date on his own milk carton. Now if I could say, you and I, we have an expiration date too, don't we? Just you and I don't know when it is. I don't want to sound morbid, but, but there could be, for some people in this room, expiration date could be pretty soon, and you and I, just, we just don't know it. Or, or it could be many, many years down the way. Jesus knew when his was, and he knew, I am invulnerable until I fulfill this person. There's 12 hours in the day, God has appointed me a time, and I am good until that time is finished. It's true for you and I as well. It's just we don't know when our date is. That means we need to be busy about the Lord's business right here and right now. Now Jesus understood that his time made him safe and secure. Now going on to verse 11, these things he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Therefore, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. So Jesus now needs to explain to his disciples. Guys, I know you think that Lazarus is only sick. I know, and seemingly Jesus knew this by supernatural knowledge, I know that he is in fact dead. And Jesus used the familiar metaphor as sleep, uh, as a picture of death. The disciples didn't catch it right away, but then Jesus had to tell them very plainly, look at it right there in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. It doesn't get much more clearer than that. Guys, I, I'm not gonna you know, beat around the bush anymore. Here it is, right, plain and simple. Lazarus is dead. And then Jesus said something very shocking in verse 15. He said, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Friends, those two phrases, Lazarus is dead and I am glad, don't go together. But again, Jesus could see what the disciples could not see. He could be glad because he, even though his dear friend Lazarus was dead, Jesus was absolutely certain of the outcome. He knew how the story would end. He, he knew. 
He knew that by the end of this chapter, grief would be comforted, life would be restored, many more people would believe upon him, and he would know that the necessary death of Jesus would be set in motion by the events of these chapters. Friends, we're going to see it next week, but at the end of this chapter, in light of the resuscitation of Lazarus, oh, did I just give it away? I'm sorry, there's going to be people who go, well, I don't need to come back next week. I know how the story ends. In light of the resuscitation of Lazarus, the reaction of the religious leaders are, we must kill Jesus now. It will set in motion the chain of events, at least humanly speaking, that will end at the cross. And that's why Jesus can look at all this and he goes, listen, I'm glad. I'm not glad that Lazarus is dead, but I'm glad for what God will do through it. I'm glad that grief will be comforted, life will be restored, more will believe, and the events leading to my death and resurrection will be set in motion. That makes me glad. Now look at verse 16. Then Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Well, thank you for that cheery word, Thomas. I want you to notice a few things. First of all, did you notice the phrase in there? Thomas, who is called the twin. There is an old church tradition, history, however you want to put it. It's a little bit murky. This isn't from the scriptures, but it's twisted. It, 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 it has some basis in history, I'll say that. That the reason why Thomas was called the twin was that because among the 12 disciples, he was the one who physically resembled Jesus the most. Therefore, they called him the twin. Oh yeah, well that, that's the one of us that he looks the most like Jesus. I'm not trying to say he was an absolute double or something like that, but of the disciples, he looked the most like Jesus. Friends, if you among the 12 looked the most like Jesus, and if the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus, Who among the 12 was in the most physical danger among the disciples? The one who looked like him the most. And yet, what does Thomas say? Thomas says, plainly and boldly, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas was willing to go with Jesus even if it meant dying with him. Maybe we need to pass a resolution. I know it's not going to work, but I'll just suggest it. Maybe we pass a resolution. We're going to stop calling him Doubting Thomas. Maybe we start calling him Courageous Thomas. Thomas the Bold. By the way, this reminds me of something, and it's a side point, but I don't mind making it. You and I know we would not want to be identified by the worst moments in our life, would we? Amen to that? I don't want to be identified by the worst moments in my life. And and I think it's probably true for you. That's why I feel a little bit sad for Thomas. Did he doubt after Jesus rose from the dead and demand to see, I won't believe until I put my fingers in the wounds on and on? Absolutely he did. That was not a high shining moment for Thomas. We all understand it. But friends, I don't know about you. I, I, I have the feeling, I know there's no violence in heaven, but I... I would think maybe Thomas is going to punch me in the shoulder if I see him in heaven. So, oh yeah, doubting Thomas. So, no, wait, didn't you read what I did in John chapter 11? Again, none of us want to be defined by our worst moments. Maybe we need to extend that grace to other people as well. Not to ignore what they've done. I'm not trying to say that. But just to say, I'm not going to define you by that worst moment in your life. In any regard, verse 17. So when Jesus came, okay, so he's finally come to Bethany now, or actually, when verse 17 comes, he's on the outskirts of the town. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, met and went, excuse me, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. 
I want you to notice this first of all. By the time Jesus came to Bethany and came to the place where Lazarus was, he had already been dead how many days? Four days. Why did Jesus delay his time in Perea two days so that when he finally got there, Lazarus had been buried four days? Friends, there's a very important reason why, and it connects with a superstition among the Jews at that time. We know this from some of their ancient rabbinical writings, that there was a superstition among the Jews current at that time that when a person died, and maybe this was just a godly person, I don't know exactly, but when a person died, a godly man like Lazarus, his spirit hovered near the body for three days. Therefore, during the first three days, there was a hope of resuscitation. There was a hope that the life might come back to the body. I'm not saying it ever happened, but at least they had the hope. The tradition among the Jews at that time said that I, by the fourth day, the spirit hovering around the body looked and saw that the body was beginning to get too decayed, too, you know, messed up, and therefore, after four days, the spirit went on, and resuscitation from the dead was absolutely impossible. Do you see why Jesus waited to come until the fourth day? He waited to come because he said, it's time for me to do a miracle that absolutely no one could ever believe could be done. I'm gonna do a miracle that is delayed long enough that everybody believes it is absolutely, positively past hope to perform. That's why he waited those many days. So here's the scene. Verse 19 says, many of the Jews had joined the women around Mary and Martha. This was a large crowd. Some of these mourners may have already been hired because they did that in that day. They would hire professional mourners because friends, both today and especially in the ancient world, when Jewish people mourn the dead, they weren't known for their reserve. It's not like a bunch of English people getting together with a stiff upper lip and, you know, maybe just a little tremble in the voice or something like that. Are you kidding? There's wailing. There's grief-stricken emotion. For you and I in our culture, which is more influenced by the English world than it is by that Middle Eastern world, we would look, go, man, this is over the top. Shouldn't these people calm down a little bit? Man, I know Lazarus was a good guy and he died, but man, aren't you making a little bit too much of this? This is a big crowd. It's a raucous crowd. It's a loud crowd. They're loud, but they're not happy. And in the midst of it, in verse 21, Martha comes to Jesus and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I don't know exactly how to take what Martha said. It feels like she's disappointed in Jesus, isn't she? She's disappointed. Jesus, if you had been here, if somehow you would have known ahead of time that he was gonna get sick, if you would have come here right as soon as as you heard the message, I don't know, Lord, Lord, if you would have come immediately or even just long distance healed him, he would still be here. But Jesus, you didn't. You didn't. I think the thought behind Martha's words have been felt in a deeply painful way by anyone who has lost someone dear to them. Jesus, no matter what the circumstances is, or excuse me, what the circumstances are surrounding the death of this dear one, you could have stopped it. Why didn't you? Listen, I can't explain why in your particular situation. What I want you to notice is that Jesus did not dismiss the question. He did not respond to Martha. How dare you ask me, the sovereign Lord, such an impertinent question? Friends, that wasn't the heart of Jesus at all. He said, Martha, I love you. I want to comfort you. Look how I will work in this situation. Now, 
she also adds in verse 22, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. I, I, I'm a little sorry that you and I know the end of the story, because you do, don't you? I think I already gave you the spoiler. We're, we're not gonna get to the actual happening of it until next week in John chapter 11. But by the end of this, Lazarus is brought back from the dead, okay? Spoiler alert. I want you to know something in verse 22. Martha does not know that at all when she says that. When she says, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. She is not saying to Jesus, Jesus, raise him now. Friends, it's the fourth day. All hope is gone. She's dealt with it. She's dismissed it. It is not in her mind at all that Jesus would bring Lazarus out of that tomb. Not at all. Therefore, when she says, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. No, what's in her mind is, Jesus, I am severely disappointed by what you did or by what you didn't do in this situation. But I want you to know, I still love you. I still trust you. I don't understand it. But I haven't lost hope in you, even though pain and grief is ripping apart my heart. This is the dearest wish of my soul for you. That in whatever pain or loss or grief you have or you are or you will experience it, that you will come to this place as well. I, I, I'm not trying to dismiss your disappointment in Jesus. No, bring it to him. He did not rebuke Martha for bringing it to him. But friends, isn't it wonderful to see that Martha had not last hope in Jesus. Matter of fact, I love how she phrases it. Look at there in verse 22. She says, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God and Jesus, even now, even though I feel you've disappointed me, even though that, I still love you, I still trust in you. And friends, there is a great power in what I would call even now faith. Listen, your problem seems as impossible as raising a dead person. Do you believe that Jesus can work in it even now? Or, or let me put it this way. Your loved one can be, spiritually speaking, and I'm speaking according to spiritual metaphor right now, spiritually speaking, your loved one can be as dead and as smelly as Lazarus. Do you believe that Jesus can work in their life even now? Or to put it another way, your own situation can be as far gone as Lazarus was at that point in the story? Do you believe Jesus for yourself even now? May God build within us this even now kind of faith. Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes that he believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. This scene right outside or not far from the tomb of Lazarus. It's where we have to leave it this morning. So come back next week in the continuing saga of Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus. Well, no, really, ne next week's amazing, no doubt about it. But let, let, let's break this down, this amazing encounter that Jesus had with Martha. First of all, he says to her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. Now, when Martha heard that, how did she react? Well, Jesus, yeah, I know. He's going to rise again with all the righteous on the last day. She did not even consider that Jesus wanted to raise her brother right then and there. I, I understand that. I mean, it wouldn't even be in her mind, would it? Okay, Jesus, great. He's going to rise again. And friends, we, we may comfort a grieving person by saying something like this. You will see him again. And we sincerely mean it. And we sincerely mean the comfort. But listen, we never mean you will see him again right now. 
Jesus meant that Lazarus would rise again right now. And this is what I want you to understand. Martha believed the truth about the resurrection of the dead, didn't she not? But she believed it in a very general sense. Jesus said, no, Martha, right now, your general belief in the resurrection is not enough. You need something very specific for your situation. And that's exactly how it is for us. Sometimes general truth is not enough for our need. Sometimes it needs to get very personal, like it did for Martha, and it needs to be immediate. What, what do I mean by that? All right, you, you may say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Amen, I believe it too. Is it personal for you? Can you say Jesus Christ is my Savior and is it immediate? Is it right now? Jesus Christ is my Savior and he's my Savior right now. You, you may be able to say, I, I believe that Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins. Great, it's true. Do you believe that he died on the cross to purchase your life and to forgive your sins? And do you believe it right now? Do you see what I'm saying? There's a difference between believing a truth generally, and it's not bad to believe the truth generally. That was a good thing that Martha believed, but friends, it's not enough. We need to come back to where we believe it personally, and we believe it for ourselves right now. That's why when Jesus says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life, it's so glorious. Jesus did not claim to have resurrection and the life. He didn't claim to know secrets or mysteries about the resurrection of the life. Instead, he dramatically said, I am am the resurrection of the life. It's as if he said this, you say you believe that your brother will rise again on the last day, but I tell you, I'm the one who's gonna call him forth on the last day, and if I'm gonna call him forth on the last day, why can't I do it right now? And Jesus is gonna do that, as we'll see in the text that continues. But then Jesus says something radical in verse 26. He said, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Jesus boldly challenged Martha to trust that he is the source of eternal life and that Jesus presented himself as a sort of champion over death. Friends, humanity in general fears death, but the Christian, the one who really believes in Jesus Christ, can only fear dying. Do you understand there's a difference? I don't expect you to not be afraid of dying. Dying can be painful. Dying can be miserable. But friends, you do not need to be afraid of death itself. Death has no power over the believer. I like something that Charles Spurgeon wrote about this. Here, look at this quote. He says, those that believe that Jesus Christ appear to die, but yet they live. They are not in the grave, but they are forever with the Lord. They are not unconscious. They are with their Lord in paradise. Death cannot kill a believer. It can only usher him into a freer form of life. So friends, outside of Jesus, death is like a prison sentence. In Jesus, death is like the invitation to the palace of a king. Outside of Jesus, death is like an execution. In Jesus, death is like changing into a better suit of clothes. Outside of Jesus, death is the greatest fear. In Jesus, death is the end of fear. It's a graduation to glory. That's what we have. And so Jesus very boldly challenged her, verse 26, do you believe this? Martha, I'm not asking you to understand it. I'm not asking you to analyze it. I'm just asking you, do you believe this? And look at how she responds in verse 27. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Martha answered very correctly. She said, Jesus, I know you are who you say you are. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And she said it very emphatically. In the original, the emphatic phrasing is there. I believe, Jesus. I believe this. I believe it with all my heart. We have to leave it there. But let me conclude with this. One writer called Martha's statement here. I believe that you're the Messiah, that you're the Son of God. One writer called Martha's statement there her foothold of faith. She didn't yet believe that Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. She didn't believe that at all. But yet, what she did believe about Jesus was like a foothold of faith that she could use to climb higher Friends, that's what I want for you. 
I want you right now to be able to look to Jesus, make a foothold of faith, and use it to climb even higher. You, you and I, we don't understand everything about Jesus. We don't get everything about him. We don't perceive it all. We don't embrace it. Yeah, I understand that. But you and I, we do understand enough about him to have a foothold of faith. Hold on, dig in to what you do know about Jesus right here and now, and then use it to climb higher in faith to him. Because he isn't just in general the savior of the world. He's your and mine rescuer. Father, I pray that you would fill our heart, that you'd fill our mind with this kind of awareness even now. And I pray, God, that you'd use this to prepare our hearts to come to your table, to receive the bread and the cup, and to make it personal. We ask that you do this in our midst, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.